Thank you, Shara and uh, Stephanie, for inviting me. And I'm glad to spend some time with you all this afternoon and tell you a little bit about what you've told me about crows, really, and uh, try to understand some of the things they do, some of the ways they behave, and some of the things you might have seen here on campus as well. I'm going to go through a lot of different stories about what these birds are able to do, but I'd like to start with a short video that I think pretty well sums up what they are able to do. And I think many of you might have seen this, but it's always great to see it again and just uh, understand the ability of these sorts of animals to solve problems. What you're going to see here is a New Caledonia crow, and uh, she's tasked with trying to get food out of a tube, which will be more apparent when the video starts. And she's given to solve that task a piece of wire. And in their native habitat, this species routinely makes and uses tools, sticks and twigs and things like that, to get worms out of crevices or grubs out of the soil, because there aren't woodpeckers on uh, the island of New Caledonia where this animal lives. So let's see what Betty is able to uh, put together to solve this problem. She's got her straight piece of wire, and she's using it, like I said, kind of like a spear, trying to spear that bucket that's got the food in it, or maybe a piece of the food out of it. It's not working really well for her at this point. So what would you do at this point? What would be your strategy? Phone, <laughs> dump it over, bend it maybe? Yeah. <clears throat> so most small children don't figure that task out. Dogs can't do that. They don't have the right apparatus, of course, to do that. But this animal is able to solve that problem. And again, it's not that unusual that she would have made a tool. That's what this species of crow does in its native habitat routinely. That's the way it solves its problem there. I think what's interesting about this video is it suggests that this animal is using insight in that it had to put together a series of events pretty rapidly. This is the seventh trial in this experiment. But she built uh, hooks like this from the first trial on. And she had to have a sequence of steps to, to carry out this task, understand the end goal, make a tool that would suit that, employ that tool, and get the food out of the tube. So that involves some sort of planning, temporal arrangement of ideas, and an idea of what you're trying to accomplish, which means that an animal, in this case, has insight into the problem. So before I get into a lot of other stories, I want to take a bit of a uh, trip into the brain of the bird. Uh, in general, and the crow in specific, so you can see how they're able to do these sorts of things. And then uh, I'll do that while you're still pretty awake, and then, uh, then we'll wake you up again after that with some interesting stories. But what this graph shows is one of the reasons a crow like this is able to solve these problems. This is the size of the bird's brain on the Y plotted against the size of the bird or other animal on the X. And what you have here are general relationships with Big animals having relatively big brains and small animals down here having relatively small brains. And there are several relationships shown here. The average relationship, for example, for fish, for birds, for mammals, and for primates within the mammals. You can see in general as we go from fish to primates, animals of the same size have relatively larger brains. There's outliers on those sorts of curves. For example, on the average bird line, here's an outlier, the ostrich. Lower on the curve than you would expect, a small brain for its body size. Big bird, little pea brain. Then there's all these other birds over here which have relatively big brains for their body size. And these are the birds we've been talking about. The, the crow in particular that we just saw, the New Caledonia crow is up here, above the average mammal line. Our American crow is even further above the line. And these birds are much more in line with a mammal of that size or even a primate of that size. So I like to refer to these birds as small flying monkeys as opposed to really birds. And it's not surprising also that they would have a brain that's, that's uh, not only large but complex because they share a common ancestry with all vertebrates. And that's what this graph shows. And I want to point out first that the art you'll see on these slides that are the black and white art are by my colleague Tony Angel. He's a local artist. He's done lots of illustrations. Uh, for the work that, that I've done, and, and lots on his own, of course, as well. And he's a well-known sculptor in town. And what Tony's shown here is the vertebrate lineage. Here's the ancestral amphibian 350 or so million years ago, which gave rise early in that lineage to modern amphibians. And then what we see here are the base reptiles that gave rise to the other forms of vertebrates. So they all came from different uh, sorts of reptiles. Mammals were the first off that line. They're not the latest, most greatest evolved thing. They're a relatively early offshoot of the reptile line. 
then more modern reptiles like the alligator here, and finally the pinnacle of vertebrate evolution at the very end, the birds, evolved off of a vertebrate line of dinosaurs, as you undoubtedly know. And Tony's also shown the brain of these animals here, and the brains of these animals all share some common properties. They have a big forebrain, they have a brain stem, they have a, a spinal cord that goes down and carries information from the brain to the muscles to do things. And the brain takes in information and uses that to make decisions. So I want to go into how that's done a little bit, but I, I forgot to mention a couple of other things with respect to the crow that puts them apart from some of these other animals. One, they're very social, and you know that from walking around on campus, you rarely see one crow, you typically see groups of them. And so they are learning and using this, this ancestry and this big brain that they have, not only in their own experiences, but by observing others in their experiences. And they're also pretty long-lived. Even though they're a relatively small animal compared to us or, or some of the larger mammals, they're not uncommon to live 20 or more years. So they accumulate a lot of information, personal and socially gathered information during that lifetime, and they put it to work in this brain of theirs. So what's their brain look like? Uh, neuroscientists, several on this campus, like David Perkel, have uh, re basically redefined how we see the bird's brain now. 20 or 30 years ago, I would have been giving this talk telling you that the bird's brain is rather simple, neural material, there's not a lot of differentiation there. But I'm here to tell you today, because of the work of those folks, that we know it's not. It's quite complex. And Tony's illustrated that here with different shadings. And those grayer areas, those are the, uh, the big forebrain of a crow, and that's especially enlarged in a crow. Think of it as your large forebrain that you use to assess information. And crows do the same thing with theirs. And they have a couple of other aspects of their brain that I want you to uh, pay attention to, because I'll bring them out later. The first is that birds have a hippocampus, just like you have a hippocampus. And hopefully, do any of you know what the hippocampus is used for? Navigation, memory, spatial memory uh, in particular, maybe other sorts of memory, social memories as well. And then how about the amygdala? Does that sound familiar to you as a part of your brain? It's a very important part of your brain that gives you emotions, fear, uh, concern about things coming up. Uh, feeling uh, satisfied with things as well. Lots of our emotional center is rooted in the functioning of that amygdala. And here we see the brain of a crow uh, in, in real life, and I want to point out a couple things on this to you to put it in perspective. Even though it's big for a, for a bird, it's still relatively small. It's the size of my thumb. It has two hemispheres, just like yours do, but its relative size is almost pales in comparison to the huge eyes that you see lit up here. So birds really are flying visual sensors. They're out there bringing in information to their eyes and putting it into their brain to work on uh, and, and understand. And they bring in lots of different information. What's shown here is how different pieces of information, visual or vocal information, or maybe touch from the bill, come to different places in the brain. They don't all just go up there and free for all. There are particular processors in the brain, just like in yours, that work on visual or vocal information. And they put these bits of information together with all those other parts of the brain to form complex memories. And they do it exactly like you do. They have the same nerve cells in their brain that you have. They're, they're neurons and they make physical connections between different places. Maybe aspects of the brain in the hippocampus that are important to where the animal's at. The amygdala about how they're feeling when they're at that place. And from the visual or vocal aspects, what they're hearing or seeing at that place. And by making those physical connections like you do, birds can form spatially uh, explicit and emotionally charged memories of events. And keep that in mind and use it later as they're acting in their lives. So when they are able to do that sort of thing, they're able to address their world in a quite sophisticated way, very similar to the way we do. And they do one last thing that you also do. And that is they can reconsider their information before they act on it. So right now, I would suggest some of you are reconsidering your decision to have come here today. <laughs> and you're wondering, why is he going off about all this brain biology, which I don't really care about? Fortunately, you are not sending the command to your muscles to get up and walk out of this room, which you could very well do. Instead, you're reconsidering that information because you've got a connection between the motor output part of your brain and a connection through the thalamus that sends information back to your forebrain to reconsider, reassess, decide, maybe you'll wait another slide or two before you walk out, 
And at that point, you will send a message down through your motor part of your brain into your uh, spinal column or, or nerve cord to your muscles to get up and do something, to act in some way. Well, birds can do that too. They have that same connection in their brain that mammals have. Reptiles may have it. Amphibians, it doesn't appear that they have it. So that may set some of the differences in how we see these different animals uh, interacting with their world. Okay, well, you don't have to get up and leave now. That's just a bit of a background on what we know about the brain of the bird. I'll come back to it a little bit with some of the recent work we're doing so we can put some of this stuff into perspective. But let me tell you some interesting stories about what people have observed these animals do and let us try to interpret those from what we know about the mental capacity of these animals. So this is a diagram that Tony drew of uh, people that reported ravens soaring at Rocky Mountain National Park. And these ravens, Unlike the typical raven soaring where they're using their wings and diving and dipping and rolling and doing all these sorts of things, these guys were surfing. They had pieces of bark in their feet and they were using them like surfboards to ride the waves of wind coming up uh, by this cliff. Why would they do that? They're great flyers. They don't need any extra airfoil here. Uh, maybe they're showing off to one another. Dominance is a very important part of crow and raven life. And so they could have been showing off to a potential partner or a, um, another social member that they wanted to impress, for example, with their uh, prowess at, at handling items like this, maybe practicing for using it in some other way, nest building or something like that. But I think in reality, it's easiest to explain this sort of behavior and the fact that they were just having fun. They were getting a charge, an endorphin release in their brain from doing this sort of activity that feels good. And that motive, that continues the behavior just like when we do something that we enjoy, the endorphin release in our brain gives us a reward that has us continue that sort of thing. It's a very important aspect. It might lead to some adaptive behavior later, or it might just help build connections in the brain that are important for some later use as well. So play we know in humans and, and other animals is very important in building brain circuitry, and that's probably what's going on with these animals as well. It's almost certainly the case here. And again, an example from ravens sliding in the snow. And you may have seen on YouTube a video that was around uh, last year or so of a crow that carried a lid up to the top of a roof in Russia and then jumped on it and slid down the roof. <laughs> and that was the same sort of thing. But it was really nice in that video is that it showed the crow picking up the lid and walking back up to the top and doing it again. <laughs> These guys also get up and repeatedly slide. So, it could be for some utilitarian purpose, but most likely it's because it feels good. This guy is definitely playing. A captive raven at the Copenhagen Zoo would frequently toss a ball back and forth, like your dog might do. They play tug of war with each other. Young ravens and crows in particular, you might see them around campus chasing each other or, or getting a paper ball or something like that and tugging with it, or a stick in this case. And they'll even play with other animals. This is a, a lot of people have had pet crows or ravens. Here's a pet crow in Ohio that would tease the, the cat it lived with by dragging a piece of string across the floor. The cat would pounce on it. The interesting thing to me here is that these animals are reading one another's emotions and reading one another's posture that this is a non-threatening situation for the crow because certainly the cat could easily pounce on the crow as well. And again, I illustrated with the New Caledonia crow video that they use insight. It's not all just fun and games for crows. They are also serious animals. And in this case, it's another uh, example from the New Caledonia crow work, which has really revolutionized how we see the complex cognitive behavior of these animals. In this case, what the bird had to do was pull up a string with a small stick and use that small stick to get a bigger stick, and then use the big stick finally to get the food. And the birds in this experiment had not done all three of these things prior to the experiment. But they had experience with the different apparatus. They had pulled up sticks on strings, but they never were used for anything. And they had seen other things in boxes like we see here. And when these crows were put into the full situation where they had all three of those pieces laid out in front of them, it took on average six seconds for them to solve the problem. They flew up, grabbed the small stick from the string, used that to get the big one, and then the food. They also take risks. I'm sure you've seen birds here in Seattle, crows diving at red-tailed hawks or diving at bald eagles around the lake or even on campus. You'll see them going after, they were going after a barred owl uh, last week by, our, by my building. That's a risky bit of business because occasionally that predator turns around and grabs the, uh, grabs the crow especially. 
but it's also risky to see them foraging, in this case, out on I-5 in California. This was a raven sitting in the middle of the road eating a jackrabbit when my neighbor was driving at high speed on the highway and screamed as he drove over this raven thinking he had killed it. And he turned around and looked and the raven had just ducked down, let the car pass over him and then stood back up and continued eating. So he was able to capitalize that meal by understanding where it was safe and unsafe in the highway. And crows have been reported doing the same thing in Seattle. But that takes, some, that takes a little bit of nerve as well as uh, some understanding of, of physics. And here's a drawing from Tony of the of crow eventually getting caught by some of the eagles or hawks they might in fact mob. But they go through this mobbing behavior, we call it, so that they're able to get predators out of their territory and live safer uh, for, for the time being. It's a benefit to them because these predators also eat their young or, or could potentially eat them. They also are showing off when they do this sort of thing. There was a nice experiment done where a, a dummy owl was put out by some crows that were feeding. And when, when they did that, the crows immediately would come down and attack the dummy owl. But if you put a dummy crow by the dummy owl, what happened is the dominant crow of the area would come and attack the, dom attack the dummy crow first. Wanted to make sure that that crow got no credit for being so close to the raven or to the predator. And instead, the crow that was dominant in the area was the one showing, hey, I'm taking the risk. So this risk, it's, it's a real risk, but it has payoff socially as well as um, from a safety standpoint. They're also delinquents. I think they, they observe what we do a lot in our environment since they live closely with us. Uh, they've been observed picking up cigarettes and swilling coffee and wine and beer and all kinds of things. And again, whether they're getting a charge out of this or not, nobody knows. They do get drunk, we do know that. Whether they enjoy it or not, there's some evidence that some crows have enjoyed that experience <laughs> because they keep doing it. But I think in these cases, what these animals are doing, they're always testing their environment. And you'll see that around here on campus. Anything that looks potentially edible, they'll, they'll mess with and they'll try it. And sometimes it pays off and sometimes it doesn't. They will work together to chase off predators. Here's a couple of ravens using sticks as tools to attack a great horned owl in California to move it out of their territory. So they don't just take things on by themselves but they live in a mated pair or other loose family groups depending on the species, and especially the pair, like you see here, work closely together to solve the problems in, in their territory. They do get in trouble sometimes when they, when they carry on these activities. Here's an innovative crow in, in Japan stealing a, a candle that's made of, of plant wax that the birds could actually eat. It's a useful food source. And they would steal these uh, candles from Shinto shrines and then fly off with them, which, you know, was bad enough. But it was really bad when they dropped the lit candles occasionally and start fires, which nobody could figure out how these fires got going until they started watching the crows stealing these. And it got me to kind of think some of the legends we have in the Northwest about the raven stealing the light or bringing light to the world might have come about from this sort of observation with our ravens or crows stealing candlefish or other um, sorts of... Uh, luminary devices that, that our early ancestors might have used. They steal other things. This is a raven from the New Halem Visitor Center up in the North Cascades, if any of you have been up there. And they do this not only there, but at Rainier and, and other national parks, where for some reason they rip the rubber off of windshield wipers. And when I was first called about this, I thought, oh, this is great. I'll go there and discover the shrine you know, that ravens are making out of windshield wipers. But that was not the case at all. They just rip them off and throw them down for the most part. <laughs> so we don't know why they do this. <clears throat> we know that it wasn't a good thing at the park, and, this, and the National Park Service was concerned about visitors driving off in the rain without windshield wipers unknowingly. So my daughter and I went up to try to teach this raven, who they called Hitchcock, a lesson. And so what we did is we, the way we catch our birds to ban them, you might have seen some banded crows on campus or, or ravens in the Olympic or Cascade Mountains. We draw them into food, and as they come in and eat, we have a remote-controlled net gun that we can fire off. Big bang goes off like a hunting rifle. The net flies over and pins the bird to the ground. We usually run up at that case and calm the bird down, put it in a sack, and make sure that it stays calm and doesn't harm itself. And we measure it and weigh it and and put bands on it or a radio or whatever we're gonna do, and then we let it go. Well, in this case, we weren't quite so gentle with this guy because we wanted him and his mate, who we caught at the same time, to form a, one of those spatially explicit, emotionally charged memories of 
being at the wrong place and not coming back here. So what we did is we caught him right in the parking lot where he was stealing windshield wipers. We took him and we banded him on the windshield of the car. So we're holding him there and he's looking at us and he's looking at the windshield and he's having a bad day. <laughs> and hopefully he's making a connection in his brain that says, this is not where I want to be. This is what happens when I'm here. And so after we were done, we let him and his mate go. And indeed, their behavior declined at that time. But the Park Service helped out as well. They gave people PVC pipe to put on their uh, windshield wipers so the raven didn't have access. And he had gotten a bad, and she had gotten a bad experience from it. And that behavior has declined. And these birds are still living out at New Halem now. The alternative was to just kill them and get them out of the system, which nobody wanted to do. But we had to work with their brain and their abilities to be able to get them trained to, uh, to handle this new situation. Well, crows and ravens are also songbirds. You might not think of them as songbirds. They don't have a beautiful song like a robin does, but they have an incredible vocal uh, repertoire. And they're songbirds technically because they're in a group of birds that has a very complex set of muscles around their voice box so they can make all different sorts of sounds. Uh, and I can play some of those for you, but what I really want to do is just play one. I want to play you the, uh, the, a sequence here of a raven actually talking in, in English. And what you'll hear is the person, uh, Mrs. Hurlbutt, who had this raven, taught it uh, how, to, how to talk. And you will hear her asking the raven questions. What's your name? What would Edgar Allan Poe think of a raven? What would he say? Things like that. And then you'll hear the raven answer, and it sounds an awful lot like the woman, but it's, it's the raven. So just listen. What's your name? Edgar's the raven answering. Well, maybe you know about Edgar Allan Poe. According to him, what is the raven supposed to say? That's the raven. So you could hear the ability to, to hear a human and replicate that voice. And that's because they have a learning loop in their brain again that allows them to hear things and adjust the output before they, they finalize the output and come very, very close to the sort of intonation that she had. I think it also clearly shows that ravens are well-read. They obviously know about, <laughs> about poetry, and, and they can answer a wide variety of questions. I don't think he really understood probably anything of what was going on there, but uh, the ability to imitate voice leads me to uh, one of the most interesting observations that I've heard about with crows. This unfortunately happened at the University of Montana campus, not University of Washington. But a friend was awakened early one morning by his dog barking in his backyard. So he goes out to the backyard, Kevin, goes out, yells at his dog, Vampire, why are you making all the noise? You gotta quiet down, it's early in the morning. The dog doesn't shut up and either does the guy who's calling the dog. Here boy, come on boy, here boy, let's go. He keeps hearing, here boy, come on boy, let's go. And so Kevin walks over to the dog and to try to confront this guy who's harassing the dog, there's no guy. It's a crow that pops up from behind the dog saying, here boy, come on boy, let's go. <laughs> this dog, paraded around Missoula, or sorry, the, the crow flew around Missoula for a few weeks rounding up dogs. <laughs> He'd bring them to the university campus, hold them at bay under a tree, as you see here, yelling at them, here, boy, come on, boy, let's go. All the dogs looking, hey, yep, where do we go? What's up? <laughs> when the classes would break, the crow would take off and fly among the students. All the dogs would chase after the crow. And our hypothesis is that occasionally a bag of Cheetos or a French fries were dropped at that time and provided a food for the crow. Or maybe the crow was just having a good time using his knowledge of how to, to, how to speak English and how to command dogs to do things on his own terms. That's what's interesting to me. Clearly, it was a pet bird that had grown up where there was a dog and somebody called a lot, and he, he learned that, that voice. But he used it under his own, uh, own command. He wasn't being trained by somebody at this point. He was out free flying and doing this sort of behavior. So, he understood the connection clearly between this strange sound that he could make and the response of another animal to it. This ability of these animals to live with us, to interact with us, to interact with our pets, uh, really has uh, engendered them deep into our culture. 
And this diagram that Tony has illustrated here shows kind of the first aspects of, of crow and raven sociality as they were foraging with other scavengers like vultures and predators like saber-toothed cats back in the Pleistocene or earlier. They were on the scene millions of years before humans were doing their thing. But as we came in, they started to use us as another source of food. They scavenged from us, they challenged us, they, they took salmon from the drying racks of the macaw. And that forced the macaw to even build in scarecrows into the drying racks to help keep those animals out. And at the same time, develop legends about how important they were. So they influenced us by being difficult to live with and a challenge and a motivation to live with. And we have lots of different uh, cultural uh, stories in the Northwest about how uh, the, the raven was a creator or very important to the people here. But it occurs elsewhere. In Scandinavia, ravens inform their god Odin each day about the state of the world. In Asia, crows and their great flocking and social behaviors motivated painters in the Edo period to, to draw great art. Maybe you've seen the screen of crows at the Seattle Asian Art Museum. It's on display many years ago. Fabulous renditions of this social behavior. And even today, they continue to motivate and, um, and influence our language. Think of all the different words in the English language that refer to crows or ravens. If you're hungry, you're ravenous. If you're gonna go someplace in a straight line, you go as the crow flies. Or you might get up to the crow's nest and look with crow's feet on your eyes to see something more clearly. Lots of different ways that these animals have influenced our culture. And they have influenced the naming of our rock bands, our sports teams, and, and movies and, and the like. And, and this is interesting to me in that they've influenced us disproportionately to other animals in our world. And we also influence them in a reciprocal way. And I wanna illustrate that with a quick example. And that is what um, an a example of in Japan bringing in uh, trees to grow there that weren't native to the area, walnut trees in particular, were brought in and planted and the crows used this artifact that people had brought in as a new food source. But the walnuts are too big to crack in their bill. So rather than using their bill, they fly and place these nuts in the roads in front of our cars so that people could run over them and crack the nut for them. And you may have seen videos of this that gets very sophisticated using the timing of red lights and things to, to be safe and accurate with this. But the interesting aspect of this behavior is actually shown in this graph. And that is, it's a socially transmitted cultural tradition of these birds to crack nuts like this. It started in 1975 around a driving school in Tokyo. Probably there was a routine path that people drove and routinely cracked nuts. The birds saw that and started facilitating it, putting the nuts down for the people to crack. And then it spread gradually over a few kilometers in a couple of decades. That slow spread of a new behavior is consistent with a culture developing, a learned tradition being passed on among the crows. And that, to me, is interesting in that it suggests that we may be uh, coupled in our relationships. As we influence their culture, such as this, they also influence our culture in getting us to drive differently. For example, I asked Professor Higuchi, who did this work, what do people think of these crows on the ground putting nuts down? And I thought he might say, oh, they try to hit them or they shoo them off. But he said, oh, no, they love it. And they try to actively aim for the nut to make sure they crack it. <laughs> so this reinforcing sort of behavior is quite, uh, quite persistent in these birds. And I think some of it stems from the fact that they recognize us as individuals and they respond differently to different people depending on their actions. And this story from Sweden illustrates that to me. A woman there was feeding magpies, and you may be familiar with magpies on the east side of the Cascades. They're related to crows and ravens, same family, big brains, social. And she was feeding bits of fat there to these birds one winter. And she thought that was neat, they, they were beautiful, she liked to have them in her yard, and she noticed they started to watch her through the windows as she'd walk by in her house, and they would pay attention to her, so she'd give them a little more food. They'd tap on the window, she'd give them a little more food. And finally, the doorbell rang. <laughs> she went outside, and the magpies are ringing the doorbell here, pushing down the tongue of this uh, fancy lion doorbell ringer to get her attention. So of course, she gave her more food, and they continued this behavior. So they shaped one another's activities. But her husband was not so keen on this at all. And he told me as, that he acted once as if he threw something at the magpies. And from that day on, they whitewashed his car windshield every morning so that he had to clean it before he could drive to work, 
They would, he would switch positions with his wife's car. Didn't work. They always got his. So some of you who are discouraged with the crows on campus, just remember that this could also happen to you. <laughs> we did tests on campus. You may have seen us walking around with these crazy masks on, trying to understand, can they really recognize individuals? Could they tell the difference between that woman and her, and her husband, for example? So what we did, again, is we captured birds, like I described, for catching that raven that was misbehaving in the North Cascades. And when we captured them, instead of just running up there and getting them out of the bag, we ran up wearing this mask, the caveman mask. We had a straw hat on as well. And we took the birds out of the net, put them in their bags to keep them calm, then pulled them out. And as we worked on them to band and measure them, they saw two people wearing these masks, and then we let them go. And we caught seven birds on campus nine years ago now doing that get up. And our idea was after we caught them, we could walk around campus wearing that mask and see the response of the birds. And we would compare it to a control situation, which was Dick Cheney, <laughs> who was the vice president at the time. And you can see this, is, this solves two problems, really. It's a difficult discriminatory task, for one thing, for the birds to tell the difference. And it's a mask. So we can make sure it isn't just a response to anybody wearing a mask, but it is you know, because it's kind of a stiff face that you, that you walk around with. So what we found was that, in fact, the birds responded dramatically different to the caveman than to our controls. So here is the response of birds before we did any trapping. And by response, what I mean here is that the birds dove at us and scolded us like they would a hawk or an eagle, like we talked about. And before we did any trapping, there was really no response to us if we didn't wear a mask if we wore the Cheney mask or even the caveman with his hat. No response to those. After trapping, again, very little, if any, response to no mask or to the Cheney control mask. But in response to seeing the caveman either with the hat or just the mask or just the hat or the, even the mask upside down, the birds went crazy and chased us and dove at us like a predator. The response to the Upside down face is interesting because people don't visual, don't see, perceive an upside down face as being a familiar person uh, very easily. You have to learn that. But birds, it appears, are able to rotate images in their brain, and that makes some sense because they often see people from above or below or different items from above below. And then what's interesting to me is that this behavior has continued. It's been good and it's been bad. I have not been able to catch any other crows on campus for the last eight years because the few that I caught and all the others that have watched them are on to the caveman. And I don't want to interfere with that experiment by catching other birds and, and having another bad experience out there. So we caught these birds. It's been almost nine years exactly now. We'll be testing this again in a, in a few weeks. And uh, the proportion of birds that scold us has been steadily increasing through time. I can barely get out of my office in Anderson Hall and walk across our little grassy area when I've got the caveman mask on before the birds are on me. And they wouldn't have seen this guy for a year or a half a year at least, and they are on him. Almost every bird who's scolding is not a bird we ever captured. Most of them are birds that either saw us make the capture or by now, an awful lot of these birds are birds that weren't even born when we did the original capture. They have learned from observing one another. They've passed on this tradition or this culture of hate, I call it, of the caveman <laughs> on our campus. And again, this cultural connection, their social tradition has been influenced by our activity. Their social traditions influence our social traditions. And that's an idea that Tony and I have called cultural coevolution. Our cultures have basically uh, come to be very closely entwined with one another's. Well, I want to take you into a little bit of a different area now and try to understand from the brain's perspective how they do this. How do they recognize a person? And I just show you this complex diagram to indicate that in humans, we have a lot of different parts of our brain. All these are different places in our brain that interact to allow us to, when we see a face, to make a quick decision. Do we know it? Who is it? How important are they? What's our experience with them? Are they happy? Are they sad? Lots of things are going on when we see faces. They're very important. And we've got special places in our brain that process that information. And with colleagues over in the Department of Radiology here, we've been trying to understand, are there places like that in the crow's brain that also allow them to do this sort of thing? So we do pet imagery of crows over there. And what we do is we'll have a crow in a bit of an experimental chamber like this, look out and see something, like perhaps the person that caught them 
or the person that's been feeding and taking care of them. Then after they've done that behavior, we anesthetize and scan them and see what part of their brain was most active during this time. And we're able to do that with this situation because uh, when we prepare our experiment, we've got a bird in the, in the uh, lab waiting to, to see something. We take him out and we give it an injection of um, radioactively labeled glucose. And that glucose is used wherever there's energy. That's the energy source in our cells, right? It goes to the part of our body that needs energy. And as it metabolizes that, that label that we have attached to it stays in that part of the brain. And then it gradually clears. And after a day, the bird's fine. We can let it go. But during the next half hour or so, there's enough differential activity in the brain that we can anesthetize and scan the brain and see where in that uh, place uh, various, um, what, what parts of the brain were used more or less, basically, than other parts of the brain. So here are some of the results that we see. Here's the image I showed you earlier that's a pet image of a crow's brain in action, looking out and seeing something. And there's two very bright areas here that are very active. A lot of that glucose accumulated there when they were looking at something, and those are the visual processing, the visual cortex of the bird. And the, what this diagram shows is for a group of birds, what are the differences in the brain activity when a group looked out and saw the person that caught them versus another group that looked out and just saw the empty room, nobody in it? And what we see here, these are just MRIs from kind of the front, the middle, and the back of the crow's brain. And the color uh, and where we've labeled it are significant differences in the response of those two groups of birds in their brain activity. And the area that's most active when the bird looked out and saw the threatening person, the person who had caught them, is their amygdala. And it's actually the right hemisphere of the amygdala, which would be the exact same part of your brain that would be activated if you looked out and saw something you learned was dangerous. In contrast, when they saw the person that had been caring and taking, feeding them for the couple of weeks we have them in captivity, it's not the amygdala that's active, but instead it's this associative reward center. It's like Pavlov's dog's brain would be. When they heard the bell, it expected food. When it saw this other person, it expected food and behaved appropriately. But what about funerals? Maybe you've seen these crows gather around a dead uh, conspecific on campus. They'll have a big ruckus, they'll scold and they'll mob, they'll do the same sorts of things that they do to us when we catch them, but they do it towards a dead individual. Maybe they're learning about the situation, in which case we might expect their hippocampus to be active. Or maybe they're learning about uh, a loss of a loved one, in which case we might expect the amygdala to be active and, and showing some kind of emotion. Sometimes when they do this, they even do crazy things like surround the body with sticks, as is illustrated here. So we were curious, what's going on in the brain when they see another dead individual? And we're able to do that in the lab. This is like you're the crow in the test looking out, and what you see is a person you've never seen before holding a dead crow. It's not, we don't, this crow has no relationship to the individual that we're testing, but it's a, uh, it's a taxidermy mount of a dead crow. And what we found was that unlike in response to seeing the person who captured them where the amygdala was activated, when they looked out and saw a new person holding the dead crow, their hippocampus was activated. So they were apparently forming a memory of this place or this person that was associated with the dead crow. And we've been testing this in the field as well and have shown that this is a fairly long-lasting memory uh, that they build at this time. Okay, I want to end up with one uh, story for you guys because it illustrates to me what I know many of you have already done, and that is when you observe something interesting that these birds do, you tell me or, or Charles or somebody else about this uh, observation. And getting that information to scientists is very helpful because uh, there's all kind of weird things happening out there, and, and the chances of, of one of us seeing it for the first hand is difficult. So it helps to have a lot of other people looking, so please do that. And I, I won't humiliate you, humiliate you like I would Gary here. But Gary emailed me, Gary Clark emailed me one day, and he said that he had been feeding crows in his yard for a long time. He really likes crows. He makes pizza for them, chicken for them. He puts them out on a special platform for them in his backyard. And one day when he went out to feed them, he said, hey, I feed you guys every day. Why don't you bring me something? And that afternoon on his feeding Platform was this candy conversation heart with the word love on it. <clears throat> so you get an email like that and you think, God, I hope Gary never figures out where I live. <laughs> well, 
But I was actually glad to get it, and I contacted Gary, and we had a great talk about it. He showed me the other things his birds had given him. An iron butterfly, cones, pieces of rock and cement, sticks, all kinds of things showed up at his feeding platform after the crows had been there. So I thought, well, we can apply the scientific method to this. We can come up with alternative hypotheses that might explain this behavior. And I've got some of them listed here for you. <laughs> Mine was that somebody had basically pulled Gary's chain. I figured his wife had put that heart on the, on the feeder, you know, and was joking with him. So we went there and we investigated. And we can reject a lot of these hypotheses. Namely, the first one is we can reject mine. Here's the feeder with a chicken on it that Gary's got in his backyard. And his wife's handicapped. She cannot get off of this deck. So she couldn't have put anything out there. He's got a fence around his yard. He doesn't have kids. You might, you might realize that his neighbors also weren't as enthusiastic about Gary's activities as he was. <laughs> And if they had gotten in and put something on his tray, I don't think it would have said love. <laughs> and then I got all sorts of other confirmations of this sort of behavior. A woman, Nancy, calls in and says that she was sitting out and a crow landed on her and gave her a wooden bead. Gail gets a red and white rocket. Leona gets all kinds of glass shards in her feeder after the crows are there. Eric, he puts out mice for magpies and they leave him shiny objects in return. And Beth in Seattle was caught in this case, Tony's drawn it here. As she was throwing kibble to the crows, she heard a key drop and looked and saw it and found out that this crow had been dropped by the crows. She picked it up and started a brand new Mercedes Benz, which she drives to this day. <laughs> she doesn't actually, she didn't get a car out of this deal, but she saw the, the, the uh, key being dropped by the crows, which is a key thing. And since those times, I've gotten, I had a, a, a seven-year-old kid come to my office um, last year with an all-cataloged container of things that crows had left her. All kinds of imaginable bits of jewelry and bent pieces of wire and all sorts of things. So this is not an uncommon behavior. And we might think it's an accident. Crows are walking around with heart pendants in their mouths, and when they see food, they drop them and take the food. They, they could very well be. I have no idea why they would, but they may. Or it may be some sort of courtship where they're trying to get the person that's feeding them to bond more closely. Or maybe they're just trying to keep that person to keep feeding them and trying to egg them on to, to do this. And in fact, a recent study done in uh, Europe has shown that crows and ravens do indeed understand giving and taking and understand who's getting what. So let me explain this experiment quickly for you. The person here is standing with her hands out and she has in one hand a rock and the other hand food. It's either cheese or it's grapes. And what the crow or raven has to do is take the rock from her bring it into the cage, give it back to her, and if he does that exchange, he gets the cheese or the grapes. And they do that right away. They learn that exchange, no problem for food, much like uh, the birds that we're seeing in the wild. But what's interesting is that they're very keen about who's getting what, and they're stacked up alongside each other here, and if they look down the row and they see a bird over here is getting cheese, and they're offered grapes, they quit working. <laughs> if they're not offered, if they're seeing a bird over here just getting food without having to do any of the rock exchange, they also quit working. So they're very sensitive to the rewards and gains, cost benefits of doing these sorts of behaviors. All right, so I just want to end with a couple of thoughts for you. As we've done these experiments, these birds have impressed us greatly. I think we've learned a bit uh, about how people and crows respond to one another, and it's a, and it's a very tightly bonded sort of situation. And I think the interesting part with our brain work is showing that this ability to form these tight personal connections with these animals in part resides in our similar brains. They store memories of us in the same parts of the brains that we store memories of them, for example. And then lastly, they think very carefully about what we do in the environment and they react to that. They take advantage of us all the time. The way we've developed uh, the Puget Sound has been perfect for crows and their population has skyrocketed in response. That often leads us to, to want to get rid of them, to reduce the number of crows, to, to get this roost moved from this place into a different place because of the potential problems with that. I would simply ask that rather than taking the first response, which is often to just eliminate the birds, uh, that we think carefully about what we've done to the environment that has allowed them to take advantage of us and try to fix those things. Instead of just the band-aid of removing the individuals, let's try to fix why they're in this particular area, why there's so many of them, and adjust those fundamental problems with the, the land or our behavior before we then uh, take it out on the birds. 
And with that, I will thank you. I would hope that you see uh, 12 crows at sunset. That's a sign of good luck. If you see like 10,000 of them, I would stop counting at 12 and call it good. <laughs> thank you. Any questions, you can step up to the mic and ask them, or you can holler. Sure, back here. Can I play the other ones? Sure. Does anybody have another question I can answer while I'm doing that? Yep. There's a difference. They're in the same genus, so they're closely related, but they're different species. And ravens are about twice as big as a crow. They're the size of a hawk that we see around here. They have, uh, you know, four-foot wingspans, and they have kind of wedge-shaped tails. And the vocalizations I'll play for you uh, are also quite different between those species. And that's probably the easiest way, if you hear them, to tell them apart. Go ahead, and we got another question. All right, so here's, here are ravens doing courtship knocking. You'll hear female crows do a rattle like that as well. The females give these rattling or knocking-like calls, not the males. To defend their territory, they give some sort of a caw if you're a crow, but if you're a raven, you do that. Sounds big, intimidating. Other ravens that hear it won't, uh, won't come into the territory. They give warning before they fight. And the trill that you're going to hear here is, sounds kind of like a sandhill crane, but it's a raven giving a warning that it's going to attack if you don't back off. Very specific. When you hear that, if you're another raven, you need to move away or you're going to be uh, in a fight. If you're hungry, you'll hear this from ravens. You may have heard that if you're camping around in the June, July here. It goes on and on and on. They duet. You'll hear a male and female of a mated pair here, and you'll hear the different voices and how they coordinate this duet. Female higher pitch, male lower. And they'll go and they'll develop, each pair will develop their own repertoire like that, and they'll learn new calls like that as well uh, from their experience. All right, thank you very much.